Meet Miriam Isherwood, a 27-year-old window dresser with an expensive passion for fashion. I don't usually buy for a reason, I just usually buy because I want to. I think the problem for me is it's literally lifestyle. This lifestyle means Miriam's skint and filling up her tiny rented room to overflow. I bought it, I wore it twice. I've never worn them ever. I'm just going to stroke. <laughs> Along with countless jeans, there are countless bags, including two from Fendi, bought in the same week. What's that? £525. And she spent piles on dress. It's very yodely. <laughs> After dress. Electric blue. Insane dress. After dress. And when it comes to bling, she's got pot loads. I feel like a bit of a pawnbroker. <laughs> Very funny. But the small matter of Miriam's 36 grand debt isn't. The figure to me is actually a myth. It's not something that touches me. I kind of like try and comfort myself by going, it's totally cool. You know, but it's, it's actually not totally cool. <laughs> But help is at hand. Psychological coach Benjamin Fry will take Miriam on a roller coaster ride to eke out the hidden reasons behind her compulsive spending. I'm worried, I suppose, that your normal life maybe seems a bit disappointing by comparison. While lifestyle expert Jay Hunt will see if she can shock Miriam out of her habits. Come inside. No, why? This is Miriam's no, boutique. Why? I really feel like. Enough is enough. I feel like it's time that I just got the right help and advice with regards to my shopping. Single 27-year-old Miriam Isherwood moved to London eight years ago. She hasn't exactly found the streets paved with gold. Despite working two jobs, Miriam earns just £16,000 a year, less than half the London average, and that's with a top degree in retail and law. I'm not challenged in either of my jobs. You know, I'm not working to the best of my ability. Miriam's a display dresser at a flagship West End store. It means she has to navigate Oxford Street, Britain's busiest shopping mecca, every day. Her other job is working as a bar door hostess two nights a week. It's not just the jobs that depress her. She lives in a cramped room in a shared, rented house. This is living like a student. You know, it's not living like an adult. And there's no escape. Her current spending means she's put on hold any dreams of owning a property. I don't have anything that's actually equitable. I don't have any sort of property or I don't have a car. The rest of Miriam's family are high achievers. Her two younger sisters are a doctor and an investment banker. Her dad is a physicist and author. In sharp contrast, Miriam hasn't got a fulfilling job, doesn't own any property and has been single for seven years. She finds pleasure elsewhere. Clothes are like theatre for me. I like dressing up. I like to feel like today I could be this person, tomorrow I could be this person. When shopping, Miriam loves to track down special pieces. She'll hunt through dozens of shops for that perfect item. I like a challenge. I think I like to hunt things down because I like a challenge. A challenge the rest of her life isn't providing. So I'm just going to literally look through this shop, try and blitz it and see if I can find anything. Oh, I love that. The hunt becomes a frenzy if the price is right. At the moment, I'm just looking at everything, and even talking to you, I'm, like, still looking around to see if there's anything I've missed. But, yeah, I'm having fun. It's cool. Her friend Orion thinks she's out of control. When she's got something in her mind, there's no getting out of it. It's that, that piece in her mind is going to end up in her closet. Clothes aren't Miriam's only problem. Each month, she spends 120 quid on sushi, over a tenth of her £1,120 pay packet. 
Some people think it's a bit excessive. I like it. So far, Miriam's non-stop shopping has landed her with massive debts, not least to her dad. She owes him over £13,000. I think when you owe your parents money, you feel incredibly guilty. I think there's no other feeling you can have. What my dad thinks about my debt is just pay it back when you can. A substantial amount should have been repaid in terms of the spirit of what we agreed. But she doesn't really take much notice of anything I say in practice. With a shopping addiction, a dead-end life and an ever-growing debt, Miriam needs help. I feel very frustrated for her because, in a sense, she's going nowhere. That's where lifestyle expert Jay Hunt and psychological coach Benjamin Fry come in. While Miriam's out and about, they're about to see the scale of the problem in her tiny rented room. So, Jay, there's just the one room on this one. Oh, yeah, because she just rents one double room and then uses it just as a kind of everything. Their initial feeling might be that of claustrophobia. Uh, I think that you could easily walk in there and feel like everything's caving in on you. Oh, can you get in? Well, it's a bit Ooh, hello, isn't it? got some company. Oh my God, Benjamin, look at all these jeans. I can't look at anything. There's so much to look at. All of these plastic things. Are those all full? Just boxes and boxes and boxes. Oh, look of at stuff. all of these watches. Oh. How many can one person actually wear? Look at all of that. Huh. Nice Louis Vuitton little raincoat here as well. Lovely. Huh. How much do you think it affects her? This being the only room essentially that she lives in. I mean, she's fitting into a bedroom all the stuff that most people might look put in a one bedroom flat. If you've only got mm. one room to live in, for a lot of people, you would make it into more of a living room than you would a bedroom. That's but true. because she's got so much stuff, it's like it, is, it can't be anything else but a storage room and a bedroom yeah. and a, you know, just a depository. I feel a bit claustrophobic in here. Do you? I don't know about you. It, I wonder if it's a bit like her head is going to be a bit cluttered. Bills. Oh, here we go. £3,000 on Barclay card. Oh, look, parental loan. <laughs> £13,271 is on her parental loan. Nice. Barclay card, 2000 Egg card. Nice. Oh, no. It's all one way traffic, isn't it? Okay, I'm we're going to take We're going to have our these. work cut out. Let's go for it. It's a wet and miserable day in North London. Jay and Benjamin have invited Miriam to her local woods for a treasure hunt. She's used to tracking down clothes and accessories in shops, but what horrors will she find here? Hey. Nice to meet you. I'm Jay. Hello, this is Jay. Benjamin. Hello, doing? Benjamin. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Have you got any idea why we brought you here today? No, I haven't. No. no. Not a clue. Not a clue. Would you like a clue? I would like a clue, yes. <laughs> OK, funny you should say that, because I have for you here a clue. The first clue in your treasure hunt. Because you are famous for hunting down items that you covered. <laughs> right. Yeah? So we're expecting true? you to be really good at this. Okay. Not sure you'll find what you want at the end of it. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Take this, okay. Thank read you. it. Head back to the crossroads and the sign. Follow the capital ring and look for the iron bars. A prison of accessories. Oh, my God. What is Where's this? the clue? Each clue contains a sum of money that represents what Miriam spent on the items in her rented room. £3,155. What's that? What do you think it is? Is that the amount I well, spent on It's the on amount of money spent on shoes and bags. And that's it? That's just all Maybe I thought was it. that? 3, no, no, I mean, that's pounds. a lot, isn't it, yes. really? Head for Hornsey and the barren expanse. £3,196. Miriam, what have you done? I think that's all the money that I spend on costume jewellery. It was a lot of stuff. And mm. it is a lot of money that I spent on just pure costume jewellery. Um, didn't really, really realise how much I'd spent. Let's see what's next. Oh, my God! My dress is hanging from a tree. Oh, my say? God. 
That is a lot, isn't it? £7,441. What do you think of that? I'm actually flabbergasted. That is all the clothes that you have bought in your room. That's a lot more than I expected it to be. You're finally, yeah. finally slightly flabbergasted, aren't you? Yeah. You were getting there. You never worked it out like this, have no, you? How much no, on specific things? No. I'm going to add this to your burdens. Okay. I think you're less clueless than when you started out today. Thanks. The full value of everything in Miriam's room is £17,938. Enough for a deposit on a flat. If we sort of fast forward to Miriam at 55, yeah. what do you want to be doing there? What's your master plan? I would like to have my own property, I would like to be successful in my job and I would like not to be spending at the rate I'm spending now. OK. Because, you know, the thing is, at 55 is the age where most people have paid off their mortgages right. because most of them have got their own property and are on that mortgage ladder before right. you. Because right. what we'd like to show you is the property that we think you will own at oh 55 if you don't stop spending. Miriam will be 55 in another 28 years, but what will shopping at her current rate mean for her dream of owning a property? Benjamin and Jay have one more fright in store. Now, I'm just going to take your blindfold off and show you your property. Now... Oh, my God. What does that say up there? Oh, my God. 137,468. Exactly. This figure represents the amount that you will have spent at 55 on clothes if you continue spending at the rate you're spending. And this here is your property because this will be the amount of stuff that you will have accumulated by the age of 55 that if you carry absolutely on. absolutely horrendous. And there won't be a house. What would you rather have? I'd rather have somewhere to live <laughs> than have loads of clothes to live on. Well, I don't want to end up to the point where I've got this amount of stuff in front of me. I think we should go and sit down and work out your cold turkey budget and get you started. Yeah, yeah? sure. All right, let's right leave this now, behind. If Miriam's spending doesn't stop, her future's looking scary. Before she finds out her cold turkey budget, Benjamin and Jay want to discover how much Miriam thinks she spends in the average week after bills and rent. Do you keep a tally? You go to the cash point? How do you organise it? I don't. I just take money out as and when I need it. So what happens when you run out, though? then um, I'm stuck and I'm eating nine pea noodles. So how much money do you think you get through in an average week? Probably about £80. Pounds. Mm. Mm. Is, that, is that unrealistic? <laughs> well, we've been through all your statements and you might be interested to know that the amount of money you get through on an average week is £140.25. <gasps> no. Seriously. Yeah, so that's what you're getting through. Right. Which is almost double what you think you're getting through. Yeah, that is, actually. What really worries us about this is that you're spending £20 a week more than you're bringing in, and also none of this is being used to pay back any of your debts, any of the credit card bills, paying off your parents, anything right, like right. that. So nothing is being, you know, made to go as an inroad into yeah, your yeah. debt. So... On the basis that that's what you spend, how much do you think would be the minimum amount that you could live on for seven days? Eighty quid. <laughs> that is no way. That is not even an quid. offer. Come on, Jay, let's go. Let's go, Jay. I'm not, I'm not even going to try. Um, maybe sixty quid. Well, actually, 60 quid. we were thinking 25, OK? <laughs> 25 quid! Oh, my... I think 25 quid is realistic. It's not being mean. That's why I'm setting you such a right, tough challenge. Okay. <laughs> By spending so little, you'll realise what's important to you. Right, OK. So it's 25 quid, seven days. Just give it your best shot, yeah? OK. £25 pounds is, in my opinion, 
doable but I think I'm really going to struggle. I'm going to go into the shops probably at some point this week but I'm just going to window shop because I also find that quite rewarding. <laughs> Day one of cold turkey, and Miriam's having to blow most of her budget on a travel card. She's worked out a cheaper way to get into work using only buses, but it still leaves her with just £8.50 for seven days. And with such a measly amount, things aren't looking too sweet. I would usually go in here on a Saturday and get myself a bar of chocolate. Um, I have popped in once in a while when I've run out of money and I've had like a pound left. I bargained with them to get me a, a, a like a cheaper ice cream, um, but today I have to walk past and alas, I can't buy anything. But Miriam's arranged a lunch with good friend Katie. It could leave her totally skint for the rest of the week. I'm on a restricted budget of twenty-five pounds <laughs> for the whole week, for an entire week. My food, Eating, yeah. going out, yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Mean people on BBC Three. <laughs> Madness, I tell you. Well, then I feel like I should buy you lunch. Oh, thank you. Miriam falls on her feet, proving there is such a thing as a free lunch. But there's still six days to go, and each day's loaded with temptation. Usually on a Saturday, I would actually go into a bar with Katie and we'd have a couple of glasses of wine. I couldn't get any wine today or anything, so that was really difficult. Um... I think I had a Diet Coke in the end, um, paid for by Katie, because that would have been an entire day's budget for me on this £25 budget week. Yeah, day one, I think I'm doing OK. We'll see you tomorrow. Over and out. <laughs> ah. By day three, the lure of the summer sales becomes too much. I'm going to buy this T-shirt just here. It's four pounds. It's a complete bargain. I like it. It's very me. So, with eight pounds fifty in her pocket going into the store, she's about to leave four pounds lighter. Retail rehab isn't working. By day four, it's time to get creative with the food she already has in her kitchen cupboards. I actually think I've got enough noodles to last me the week in here. <laughs> I really do have enough noodles to last me the week. Hmm, but seriously, Miriam needs more than just noodles to eat, and she's only got £4.50 left. I'm going to try and spend £1.50 max in here today. I'm going to be on budget, blue stripe, cardboard, crap. <laughs> She'll have to watch every penny to stick to her rigid £1.50 target. <laughs> I'm not happy about this at all. <laughs> oh, my God. OK, where are the tin tomatoes around here? But on the way out, Miriam freezes at the sight of her favourite food, ice cream. Mango and passion fruit, that sounds amazing. Strawberry cheesecake sounds amazing. Two for five pounds sounds even more amazing. And I'm not going to even look anymore. Miriam goes over her self-imposed supermarket budget of one pound fifty by just 39p. Thank you very much. She's five days into her cold turkey week, and with two pounds sixty-one left, Miriam's doing well with the challenge. Her coping strategy could be a clue for Benjamin as he begins piecing together the reasons behind her spending. I wonder if there is something about running out of money. It could be a thrill sort of thing where at the end of the month I'm running out of money and it's like this desperate, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? And how, how far can I make my however much money I have left stretch? It's about getting close to the edge, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Benjamin's wondering if Miriam's love of living on the edge with huge debts is rooted in childhood experiences. Maybe when I was young, I used to always be late for school. So mm. I'd get up late, and then I was actually rushing at the last minute to get my bus. So what was it about going to school that was not a warm and snug and cosy environment? I didn't feel integrated in that school. Miriam went to school in rural Essex, 
She'd moved there from Nigeria at the age of five with her white English father and black Nigerian mother. Until her sisters joined her, Miriam was the only black child at her village school. I think that a lot of people weren't open to different cultures mm -hmm. in the area that I grew up in and weren't really open to sort of understanding somebody who wasn't exactly like they were or didn't have the same views as them or didn't grow up in the same environment as them. So, yeah, it wasn't really warm and cosy, obviously, because, you know, I did feel like a bit of an outsider there. Benjamin wonders whether Miriam's parents have felt a need to overcompensate for her experience. It may explain her father's pattern of bailing her out with loans of money. If he'd never done that, uh, where do you think you'd be with your debts now? I'd probably be better off, actually, because I probably would have worked. And I wouldn't be such a spendthrift. Benjamin's also keen to find out whether Miriam has any passions. My passion is singing. Singing? Yeah. OK. After hitting her teens, Miriam began to spend time in recording studios. She's recorded a number of demo tracks, but none of them have ever hit the big time. Would you like it to be your career, though? Is that yes, I would. I think... Your goal? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And do you... Um, where do you feel you are with that goal? Do you feel that's realistic? I find it very hard to find the time sometimes when I'm doing two jobs. What if your singing career just dwindles and dies? I've and still got a fabulous wardrobe. Still got a fabulous wardrobe? <laughs> that's your initial response, that's your first answer. Yeah. But that's what's going to get you into trouble. With no sign of a big record deal, Benjamin's wondering whether Miriam's dreams of being a singer are actually holding her back. What I do think I maybe need to do with Miriam is help her to give up on some of her childhood fantasies and move towards more realistic adult goals and help her feel OK about thinking about doing that. But whether Miriam will be up for Benjamin's challenges is another thing altogether. One thing Miriam has done well is living on the edge with her cold turkey budget. By the time it's all over, she's got £1.76 left, just enough to treat herself. I've just finished cold turkey. I've had £1.76 left, and I went to Tesco's and bought myself a bottle of Lambrini. I have paid £1.44 for this, so technically I still would have ended up with 32p. So I'm really, really pleased, and I'm going to go home and drink this, and I'm going to get sloshed even on a little bottle like this. So, yeah, I'm really pleased. <laughs> I'm really pleased. Having done so well on £25 for a whole week, Jay's keen to deliver Miriam with her budget for the next five years. So, what we've got here is Miriam's new budget. Right, okay. okay. But before we have a look at this, yep. I just wanted to find out, how did you do the cold turkey week? I did crack halfway through the week and go into uh, Prime Arnie <laughs> and buy myself a T-shirt, uh, which I really love, and that sort of ate into my budget. Right. That was nearly half my weekly budget. But it kept you going but, for Yeah, the rest but it of the still week. kept me going. In a normal week, Miriam would spend an average of £50 on clothes. So £4 isn't bad. So what we've got here is current expenditure. We've added everything up here, and at the bottom we see that you're spending £1,212.30 a month right. and you're bringing in £1,120.94. Right, okay. So every month there's an overspend of £91.36 right, okay. on top of everything else. Right, OK. So that's obviously making sure your debt is increasing all the time. Right, OK. Miriam owes 36 grand on cards and loans. She's only paying the minimum interest each month, meaning she's not getting anywhere with reducing her debts. One of the areas where we've actually increased your payments is the debts. Right, right. And we've actually upped it to £400 a month. Right. So that £400 a month would actually take you five years at right. that rate right. to pay off this debt. Right, OK. If we could find an extra £90 a month, if you suddenly got a raise, unexpected money, something like that, right. 
it immediately drops to four years. Miriam needs to set up larger direct debits to the credit card companies and her parents to start getting rid of her debt. Jay's also looked at her other spending. Now, when we look at food and housekeeping, the food shop at the moment, 10367. Right. We've cut that back right. to 75. Okay. You know, not a huge problem for you, no. but right. something that came up which was quite surprising here is sushi. I love sushi. Oh, it's like this enormous budget every month goes on sushi. So we have slashed that back. Oh my god, no sushi. Well, there is no sushi at the moment, but you know, there's not, nothing to stop you using the £8.86. Clothes at the moment, you're spending 200 a month. Right. And we've cut that back to 50. Right. I mean, how does that make you feel? I think that after being on cold turkey for a week, I can definitely control that. Because I think the thing is with you is that it's, it's all or nothing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're yeah. either out there spending compulsively or it's like, I'm actually really quite good at not spending and surviving on yeah. one pound. It's nowhere close to what I thought it would be. Oh, so really? Actually, yeah, I actually thought it would be a lot worse. There are certain things on there that I'm not having to um, give up or cut back on and I'm still able to pay back my debt, which is the important thing. It looks like Jay is getting through to Miriam and she can now see how things could start to change. I feel like I'm definitely changing the way I feel about money. I think last week I thought that money was sort of monopoly. I thought it was a bit of a game. I thought it was there just to be spent. Whereas now I realise that, you know what, I can have a funky still, you know, life in London, have fun and still not piss all my money up the wall. For Miriam to stick to her strict five-year budget, she's got to cut down on the clothes shopping. It's hard when she has no idea what she already owns, all hidden away and out of sight. That's until now. Jay's decided to shock Miriam by showing her the scale of what she owns. She's taken all the clothes from Miriam's room and put them on display. It's her very own shop. Welcome. Come inside. No, why? This is Miriam's no, boutique. Why? You know when you joke with some people and say you've got enough clothes to fill a shop? Well, look, and I would like to point out to you, Miriam, not only are we filling a shop, but look how high oh all my, these piles of stuff are. Yeah. Can I swear? Yeah. Now. <laughs> I'm completely and utterly shocked. In Miriam's boutique, among many other items, there are 40 pairs of jeans, 70 handbags, 85 dresses, and 166 tops. Is there anything out of all of this that you could maybe look at not needing anymore and maybe we could think about selling it? How does that make you feel? Not happy. I'm speechless. I'm actually speechless. Yeah, I think that everything is worth considering, but right now... OK. It's hard. It is hard. Are there some stuff that you would actually like to get rid of to free up a bit more room? I think the room thing is an, as an aspect. I don't right. think I need so many shoes, especially as okay. I don't wear half my shoes. I'm not negotiating with my dresses and my bags. OK. Stop. So why don't we concentrate on looking through some tops and jeans okay. and these shoes down here and... Try and fill one of these boxes with things that, that you I would be prepared want. that you don't want. So you have this choice. It's about what you don't want. Right. Does that make you feel a bit better? Yeah. All right, let's get going. Taking stock of her wardrobe is a good deterrent to wasting money on things she already has. Jay's hoping that if Miriam can do this, she'll not only declutter her bedroom, but realise she really doesn't need to buy anything else. This is very therapeutic. Are you starting to enjoy this? Yeah, I am, yeah, yeah. At the end of the afternoon, there are two boxes of clothes to throw out and four to store in the loft and hopefully think about later. More significantly, the process has put Miriam off shopping for any more. I think that's more than you thought. To be honest, when I walked in here, I felt really emotionally attached to everything in the room. Right. And I really felt like it was one of those things that was going to be a very difficult task for me. But once I went round the room, it was actually very quick for me to decide what I wanted to get mm. rid of. I learnt a little bit more about how I can actually release and let go of these things more than I perhaps thought before I walked into this room. 
And yes, I do have a shop's worth of clothes in my room, whereas now I have a little bit less. Now, Miriam, you've got half a shop's worth of clothes. Yeah, yeah. which is good. See, we're making progress. Yeah, we are making progress. I feel really good. I think Miriam has actually surprised herself today because I don't think she realised how well she could do. She's very emotionally attached to her clothes. And yet, by the end of it, she was quite in the mood. Right, that's going, that's going, that's going. No pressure on her. She was doing all of that herself. So she's come quite a long way. To be honest, I'm not really looking to buy anything else at the moment because having gone through this journey, which I've gone through today, I realised that I was holding on to a lot of things. Um, still not sure what I'm holding on to. A few days later and the harsh shock of Miriam's boutique is still resonating. I've got a leather jacket here which I haven't worn in ages and, you know, a few other bits that I just don't need. So um, I've decided just to keep looking through my wardrobe um, and I'm probably going to do this on a regular basis now and just start chucking stuff out. And then it's time to wave goodbye to some of her clothes at the charity shop. With all this progress, Benjamin wants to push Miriam further. He worries she's underachieving and thinks her constant need for thrills might help explain her dangerous shopping habit. He's brought her to a theme park. Do you have any idea why I brought you here today? No, not really. OK, well, the thing is that we have explored. You have a little bit of a tendency to live life on the edge. Right. Now, I'm worried that when things get difficult, what you do is you push it and push it and push it and see how far you can get away with it. Is, yeah. that, yeah. is that right? I think that's probably quite true. Oh, my God. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> you I worry about. You want to do that. Yes. Benjamin's hoping that riding this roller coaster will help Miriam consider why she likes to live life on the edge. I feel great. Yeah, you feel great? <laughs> I feel terrified. Yeah. Oh, my God, the lights are going to go! <laughs> oh. running out of money, isn't it? Because it gives you this thrill. Yes, it does. It gives me a thrill. It gives me the feeling of life. It gives me the feeling of slight desperation. And it Why makes you Why do you, you want to feel... feel like that? Because, you know, what, it's, it's nicer than feeling so boring all the time or bored or, yeah. you know... So um... life without these kind of thrill experiences is a bit boring and you're a bit bored? No, I don't suppose they are, but um, it sort of helps. It seems to be what you're saying. Yeah, it's You need helps. this stuff to pick you up. I'm worried, I suppose, that your normal life maybe seems a bit disappointing by comparison. Maybe a bit depressing even sometimes. And that this, this kind of thing can really pack a punch and get you going. <laughs> yeah. To get to the bottom of this disappointment and depression, Benjamin takes Miriam to a quiet corner of the park. I think you'll find that if you really took life on and if you took on every day, the kind of challenges that suit your abilities. Every day would be like being on this roller coaster. Yeah, true. But you'd be challenged every day and you get a sense of being tested. Yes. And that would be your thrill. Yeah. But the moment you're just sleepwalking through your life. Yeah, I am. Mm. Why? Why? Yeah, why? 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 Yeah, why? Yeah, why? You tell me. Uh, yeah, exactly. You don't know. I don't know. Why are you avoiding your potential? Um, because I'm lazy, I think. I think sometimes I can get lazy. Sometimes I can get stuck in a rut and just it's easier to face it. OK. Uh, lazy can often mean I'm waiting for someone else to do it for me. Yeah, maybe. Who? No one. Because <laughs> I think your dad's involved a little bit as a player. Mm. Because he has enabled you to continue playing this game a bit longer than you might have done. Um, 
I mean, that is one way of looking at it, but I don't think it's the right way of looking at it. Miriam still owes a £13,000 debt to her dad. Although it's very, very latent and very unconscious and very much not put on the table like this, maybe you're testing him to see how much he's going to be there for you. And you push yourself to the edge and to the edge and to the edge. You're testing yourself, you're testing him, you're testing the family, seeing just how much Miriam can muck about and get away with it. A bit like a naughty girl trying to hide under the duvet and make that last minute dash for school. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. One of the reasons it's Maybe. sometimes hard to kind of take on adult forms and relationships and responsibilities is because we're not finished being kids. I think what's interesting about Miriam is that she does acknowledge that there's perhaps a missing part of her adult self. There's something about this thrill-seeking, which we exaggerated, of course, hugely today, which she recognises as being slightly a childish reaction to not feeling that life is interesting enough. She says she's bored. Well, if she's bored, then she should challenge herself more, because that's what adults do. It's kids that wait for someone to take them to a theme park. So I do think we need to work on what Miriam hasn't finished about her childhood and what it is she now needs to recognise and leave behind. For the first time, I sort of thought to myself, well, when I phone Dad and when I speak to him, I don't see to, or think to myself, oh, you know, this burden in the back of our relationship is affecting our relationship. But subconsciously, it must be, because when I spoke to Benjamin, he said, and it was a very sort of telling way of sort of communicating it to me. Money always affects relationships. But just as it looks like Miriam's starting to understand her spending, she falls off the rails, big style. With a fortnight's holiday from her two jobs and having been a good girl for a week or two, Miriam's gone into teenage rebel mode. She's seeking new thrills by partying. And it's costing her. Went to Alex's, did some shots of rum, came back here, had another glass of one of these, went next door, had a couple of shots of gin, and by the time I came back here at half ten, I was paralytic. Night after night, Miriam's out till the small hours. Her money's going up the wall on drink after drink. Went out with my girls, went out with a whole bunch of people, and... Um, by Monday, this Monday, I'd run out of cash. Literally, I went to the bank and I was like, oh, whoops, ne negative equity plus negative equity. Oh, look, Miriam has nothing in the bank. Perhaps she needs to sort this out a bit. Jay and Benjamin have met up for a crisis meeting to exchange notes and plan the way forward. You know, because of the fact that she's taken some time off work and the lack of routine has resulted in her really, really upping her spending. So how have you been getting on? I certainly have covered with her that there's something from her childhood that she feels is not finished yet. Yeah. And there is something quite childlike about her sometimes mm. when it comes to her behaviour and her habits. So I think, Jay, without access to really deeper material and deeper issues, what I can do really usefully maybe is to prepare the ground a bit on the surface psychology so that she might be more receptive to the stuff that you're going to bring her on a more practical level. I agree. Well, the first practical thing I want to do is to talk to her about staying on the straight and narrow. Otherwise, it's all going to be off the blooming rails. Jay thinks Miriam's in denial. She wants to sit her down and give her a good, hard talking to. So how much money is in your <laughs> account? Right. Um, well, I actually flatlined on Monday. I went to the bank and I had absolutely nothing in the bank. So all this partying going on, have you been buying anything? Um, I bought myself something yesterday. Oh, OK. What did you buy? A bracelet. And how much was that? £30. OK. Which is £30 you don't have? Yes. Have you found any time to set up the direct debits to start paying back the debts? No. No, so no. we haven't done that yet no. at all. Because it's now another month that's gone by with no money going towards paying the debts back and your mum and dad are still waiting. Yes. Can we absolutely now 
set up the direct debit so that that money that's going to go back towards the debt is non-negotiable? Um, yes. Yeah. So absolute commitment on that. Yeah, we could do, yeah. All right. By the time Miriam gets home, Jay's words have begun to sink in. This needs to be resolved. And if Jay could help me uh, through a little bit of a telling off, then, you know, long term it's not so bad. And I need to find a way around it because I need to pay off these debts. Frittering away a fortune on sushi is another problem Miriam needs to face. She spends more than a fiver every day on this stuff. Jay's lined up a sushi making lesson so that Miriam can roll her own daily fix for as little as 50p. I'm gonna leave you here with May, okay. sit over there, and yeah. wait for you to cook me my Oh lunch. my god! Okay, okay, yeah, okay, I'll try. Shop bought sushi might be pricey, but the ingredients aren't. Miriam could buy 10 sheets of seaweed for about 80p. May, how. Yeah. how... Do you make the rice so sticky? We need to put some sushi vinegar. I see. Oh, so okay. you can buy it. I see. And a bottle of sushi vinegar will last for weeks and only cost her £1.30. Oh, so happy? Yeah, I'm really happy. I feel really sort of like I've learned something really good today, like really new and different. My God, we've made quite a lot of sushi, haven't we? That looks pretty yeah. professional. I'd eat that. There you go. Oh, my love. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, enjoy oh, that. Yeah. How's it taste? Mm. Really? Oh, thank you. I think I might start making sushi every day instead of 9p noodles. You've got the Japanese supermarket right on your doorstep. And that's exactly what Miriam does. At the Oriental supermarket, she buys enough stuff to make a month's worth of sushi for the cut price of £11.80. Much better than the 120 quid she used to spend. I can't understand why I've been doing that for so long, buying sushi without coming somewhere like this and actually saving myself a huge bundle of money, because I think I could have saved myself hundreds of pounds by now. At home, the chance to test out her newfound skills. I need to get one of those really good knives. Well, you know, my first sushi experience at home wasn't perfect, but I have tried now. I know how easy it is to make sushi, and hopefully in the long run it's going to save me buckets of cash. A few days later, Benjamin catches up with Miriam. He's worried about the consequences of her underachieving and suspects that clinging on to childhood dreams is stopping her from moving on in adult life. He wants to explore the passion for singing that began when she was a child. My worry for Miriam is that if she is still clinging on to childhood dreams, then she's perhaps missing out on setting more exciting and more reasonable adult goals for herself. Sitting with my friends, I kind of He's brought her to a studio to record a track she's written herself. Miriam's always dreamed of singing success, but like thousands before her, the big record deal never happened. It seems that Miriam's really up on the creativity of being here today, working in a creative team, feeling really challenged, being put on the spot. And those are all qualities that you can find in other areas in life, in other areas perhaps in her work. It's just that I don't think she makes any effort to look for them outside of singing because her heart is still set on being a singer. Sitting with my friends, I kind of feel... How was that, Miriam? Yeah, it was really good, thank yeah? you. Yeah? Yeah. Seems to me that there's a slightly kind of childlike quality to this experience. Like you, you seem very free and creative and quite bubbly. It's fun for me. This is yeah. the absolute fun. It's like playtime. Yeah, it is, this, this is um, a chance where I can actually just express myself and go and, mm -hmm. um, and just feel totally creative. Yeah, so that's why I like it. So it's kind of like playtime. Yeah, for me it is a play, it's my form of playing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. OK. Benjamin suspects it's not just the act of singing itself that Miriam loves. 
He takes her to sing in unfamiliar settings to gauge how she reacts. First up, it's church and a gospel choir. Thank you. Hello. Swing low, swing chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Swing low, swing chariot, coming forth to carry me home. When the session's up, how did Miriam rate the experience? I suppose what's interesting to think about is what were the differences? The difference was this morning I was on my own trying to create something, whereas this afternoon it had already, already been created, so it was, I was able to fall into a, a role or a slot a lot easier. Yeah. And yet... I felt that I had actually achieved more this morning, to be fair, in an hour. Yeah, sure because, that's true. Yeah. Benjamin's wondering if the lack of creativity in singing with the choir is why she was resistant to it. He decides to up the ante for his last singing session. He wants Miriam to busk on Carnaby Street. Swing along, <laughs> swing chariot. Oh, this is just stupid. Come on, bring some people over for the I hat. Can't even, I can't even sing that song. Louder. No, I'm not shouting a song that I don't oh, I know how to sing. You. It doesn't make any sense to be singing this song. Why not? Swing low. <laughs> swing low. Swing chariot. Shall I keep going? Swing chariot. Thank you. <laughs> swing. Coming forth to carry me home. But you haven't exactly thrown your heart and soul <laughs> no, into it. I, I have to say, you seem a little bit. Well, let's let's be let's be honest. You seem a lot less enthusiastic about this than you were about being in the studio. Yes, true. Um, but it's the same skill. It's singing. Yes, so what's yes. different? And this morning in the studio, I felt very creative because obviously I was able to just use different sounds and think, okay, next I'm going to do this, or you know. But I didn't feel. You know, right. For me, it's about being totally creative. Okay, so I think what we're seeing from this is that for you, it's not enough to just be singing. What you really encapsulate in the idea of saying, I dreamed of being a singer, is saying, actually, I want to be very personally creative. Yes. And I think a really good step forward for us might be to think about separating out singing from being creative. Something that comes merged together in the studio, but by the time you get to Carnaby Street and singing on the street corner a song you don't even like much, <laughs> you can realise that singing in of itself is not the goal, it's not the dream. Yeah. There's more to it. Yeah. I wonder if maybe we can think about separating these things out so they can become more practical and more available to you and more stimulating to you in your life. I do think the breakthrough with Miriam today has been that she's seen that her, her love of singing, of being a singer, isn't as simple as she maybe thought it was. Because actually singing, per se, on its own, isn't what she craves and what she's so keen on. It's the act of being creative, the act of making things happen, the act of being perhaps challenged. And I do think there's a real connection here between the lack of all that stuff in her life and her thrill-seeking behaviour, which she particularly plays out with money. I feel that, for the first time, perhaps I am understanding I need a little bit more creativity or a lot more to feel stimulated and rewarded in my day-to-day -day life because right now even though my job is technically meant to be creative I don't feel creative at all. With Miriam realising it's creativity she craves rather than just singing, Benjamin hopes that she'll take steps to incorporate it into her life. <laughs> Jay has just the plan up her sleeve. She's brought Miriam to an exclusive Covent Garden boutique, but they're not here to shop. One of the things that we've been exploring with you is thinking about career development yeah. and getting you more focused on that, maybe moving up the ladder. Now, we're going to go in here because okay. I've arranged for you to have a chat with Emma, who's yeah. actually the buyer. Oh, wow. Would that be something that would interest oh! you? Yes. No, you're looking at me. <laughs> Now I'm going to leave Miriam with 
you, Emma, for your masterclass in buying. She is already enthusiastic, so we're halfway there. Buyers choose the fashions they hope will bring customers into their shops to spend money. They can work individually for boutiques like this, as well as in big teams for major high street chains. We basically go to all of our buying appointments, um, shows, trips abroad, so like France, Milan, Paris, um, and just seeing the collections and getting a feel for what's going on in the next season. It's always a season forwards. A look at Emma's diary proves it's a busy job. We're going to New York. OK. <laughs> We're going to New York for, like, three days. Okay. Um, seeing Marchessa, we've got appointments at Marchessa, Dirk Lamb. After New York, we've got a day of rest, and then we're all straight off to London Fashion Week. Yeah, it's going to be a busy time, but this is when it gets exciting, and mm. you've got... There's so much, sort of, fashion going on. It's just, If you're a fashion person as you are, it's just, like, it's amazing. Yeah. What would you say the main challenges are um, with regards to being a buyer and... Do you think it ever gets stressful for you at all? You have to really consider, like, your budget and you have to decide, if you decide that you really like this this entire Balenciaga collection, are we going to pay more for that one? And we have to think, do we have to cut back on, on Chloe, maybe? Emma has responsibility for spending up to half a million pounds at a time on high-fashion clothes. What's more, it's not her money and it doesn't end up cluttering up her home. So how was that? Fantastic. Really, really interesting. You look quite sort of... Ooh, yeah. Yeah. I was really engaged in what she had to say, actually. But I'm glad that you're thrilled by it, because actually we've arranged for you to have an interview to go and no. work in buying. So would, is that OK with you? That's fantastic with me. Yeah? Happy? Yeah, Commit absolutely. to that? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Oh you're, on. you're on. You're on! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to shop and actually not take the stuff home, but just buy it anyway. <laughs> I just thought to myself, that'd be such a cool job. A month ago, Miriam's finances were spiralling out of control. £36,000 in debt, she was squandering money on sushi and clothes she didn't need. Life was humdrum and creatively unfulfilling. But now it looks like all that's about to change. She's finally taking an opportunity to achieve her potential by going for a job that'll not only stop her personal spending, but bring in much more cash and pay off her debts much more quickly. The big day finally arrives. Miriam's taking a chance to break her cycle of underachieving. Hello. Hello, it's Miriam. I'm here for my interview. I feel a bit nervous about the interview. Um, but I also feel really excited about the interview. Miriam is being cross-examined by Charlie Gerver, a fashion and retail personnel, a specialist at recruiting buyers. Hi, Miriam. I'm Charlie. Hello, nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Do you want to go through there and take a seat? Yeah. Almost an hour later, and it's all over. But will Miriam make the grade? I'm confident that we'll be able to help Miriam and get her position as a buyer's admin assistant for our retailer. And who knows, in seven years' time, she should be able to be a head of buying, earning in the region of 100,000. I, I, I really can't express how excited I am by this whole experience, and I just want to go home and redo my CV straight away. And, and I... Thank you so much. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. Thank you so, so much. Now it's time for Miriam to report back to Jay and Benjamin. So, Miriam, how did the interview go? Um, yeah, they really liked me. Oh, good. I don't want to sound like a big head, but they did. <laughs> and, um, yeah, they're going to put me forward for a job. So, yeah. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Very well thank done. Thank you for sorting it out as well. Thank you. Where do you think your creativity's gone to now? With regards to passions, like throwing myself into one thing and not really concentrating on the bigger picture, I think I've learned that there are things that are just as important as, you know, going out and having fun and doing a more creative job, not something that's a pseudo-creative job, I think would actually be a lot more enriching for me and I think I'd get a lot more out of life than what I'm getting at the moment. 
and maybe that ha does have a relationship with your spending. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. I think if I was actually buying loads of stuff that wasn't mine, I'd enjoy it a lot more because I wouldn't have any debt. Now, finances. Have you actually got round to setting up the direct debit yet? I have. I've oh. set up my direct debit. I've got my money coming out every month now on a particular date. So I'm going to be paying off all my credit cards yeah. and it means that my parents can get their money back as well. So what happens now? Because obviously you're still finding yourself in shops, but how are you controlling your spending? I've totally changed my attitude to shopping. I'm totally over it. To a certain degree, I'm very aware of what I'm spending now, which I wasn't before. Yeah. And now, um, I go into a shop and within about two or three minutes, I just can't be bothered. I want to get out.